There's a tiny island surrounded by the stunning clear Red Sea and a bustling underwater world. Zabargad, also known as St. John's Island, has no trees and consists mostly of peridotite, which is rich in peridot. And before you Google it, peridotite is a gemstone that has the nickname the Evening Emerald because of its sparkling green hue. Some historians believe Cleopatra herself loved peridots, and that lady could afford any jewels in the world. Geologists believe peridot forms as a result of the spreading of the seafloor. When the Earth's crust decides to part ways, rocks from deep down get pushed up to the surface. That's exactly how our treasure island formed. The African and the Asiatic continental plates bumped into each other, and rocks in the lower crust went above sea level. Peridot also comes from meteorites that have crashed into Earth, but that's really rare. Its color ranges from a brown-green color to yellowish-green to pure green. Yellowish-green is the most common shade you'll see in jewelry. This color is possible thanks to a good amount of iron in the stone. The deposits of this beauty are spread all across the world, from Vietnam to Arizona and Hawaii, Tanzania, South Africa, Sri Lanka, and Norway. And then, of course, there's a Bargod. So, this place is geologically unique as it's an island built of uplifted mantle, and it's also the oldest and longest known source of peridots in the world. The first people came here for the gemstones many centuries ago. Famous Roman philosopher Pliny the Elder mentioned in his writings that pirates had discovered Zabargod's treasures in the year 500 before the current era. The beautiful green rock.
observation online and experience the floating life yourself. Some islands pop out of nowhere, and others disappear without a trace. One of the most famous so-called phantom islands is High Brazil off the coast of Ireland. Before you ask, no, it doesn't have anything to do with Brazil. High is a variation of I, which means island, and Brazil comes from the root Brez, meaning mighty, great, beautiful in Irish, and it gave the name to one of the local deities. This tiny mist-covered island was first mapped in 1325, but later attempts to pinpoint its exact location didn't come to one result. So, legend has it that the island appears only once in seven years, and even those who claim to have seen it say they had just sailed right through it without bumping into any land. Captain John Nisbet shared the story of how he had not only spotted High Brazil, but got stranded on it with his crew. According to him, the island boasted a castle and was mostly uninhabited. There was even an encounter with an ancient grave gentleman, who shared the island's ancient history over a lavish feast. In the late 15th century, a series of expeditions set sail from Bristol to find the famous island. All attempts failed, and High Brazil disappeared from the maps in 1865. We might never find out if it was there in the first place, but it's a beautiful story anyway. One interesting thing that happens in map design is the so-called Baltimore phenomenon, or Baltimore effect. This phenomenon happens when a city or another object is left off a map because there's just not enough space, while smaller cities make the cut simply because there is room for them. The name comes from Baltimore, Maryland, which often gets left out of maps because it's surrounded by bigger cities like Washington, D.C. But on the flip side, sometimes smaller and less well-known cities like Alice Springs in Australia end up on the same map simply because there's enough space for them. Like at this scale, Alice Springs, which give or take 25,000 inhabitants, is labeled. But the huge city of Guangzhou, with over 14 million people, is somehow not. This phenomenon is more common on automated mapping sites, but it doesn't happen at every zoom level. On popular sites like Google Maps and other similar ones, you'll only start seeing Baltimore show up at certain zoom levels, like the 5th, 6th, or 7th zoom. Cartographers can tweak their maps to make sure they're useful and convey spatial information effectively, finding the right balance between showing important details and keeping the map clear and focused. The best maps are the ones that show key elements clearly, while still accurately representing the world. But Alice Springs is not the only weird thing on the map of Australia. Look at the time zone map. This 10 and a half section looks a bit off, huh? Well, Australia is officially divided into three standard time zones, Western, Central, and Eastern. Australian Central Time aligns with UTC plus 9.30, with individual states and territories deciding whether to observe Daylight Savings Time. Australian island territories and Antarctic stations contribute to the complexity of the time zones. Despite this, Australian time zones are generally easy to understand. In addition to the official time zones, there is an unofficial hybrid time zone called Australian Central Western Standard Time. This time zone is halfway between Western Time, UTC plus 8, and Central Time, UTC plus 9.30, making it UTC plus 8.45, a unique quarter-hour difference. Australian Central Western Standard Time is only observed in a small area in far southeastern Western Australia, along the Eyre Highway. The Australian Central Western Standard Time area includes settlements such as Conkobiti, Madura, Mundrabilla, Eucla, and Border Village. Only a few hundred people live in this region, making it easier for them to agree on a non-standard time zone. Despite the lack of official approval, Australian Central Western Standard Time continues to be followed due to the significant time gap between Western and Central time zones, especially during the summer when South Australia observes Daylight Saving Time and Western Australia does not. 
The use of this unique time zone can often lead to confusion, even amongst the locals. Eucla police, for example, operate on Perth's time zone, causing occasional tardiness to events such as community gatherings. Locals mentioned that in the past, Eucla operated on its own unofficial time, which made things simpler, before the transition to align with Perth time. They also face confusion as their location in South Australia does not observe daylight savings. The history of the Australian Central Western Standard Time dates back to the establishment of a telegraph station in Eucla in 1877. Although the exact origins of this time zone are unclear, it is speculated that it was adopted to avoid confusion at the telegraph station located on the border between Western Australia and South Australia. UTC plus 945 was historically utilized in Australia as a time zone known as Central Western Daylight Time. Certain roadhouses along the Eyre Highway in South Australia and Western Australia adopted UTC plus 945 during the summer months when South Australia observed daylight savings time. While not officially recognized by the authorities, the boundaries of this time zone are clearly outlined and often depicted on local roadmaps. Five locations in Australia, including Border Village, Kaguna, Eucla, Madura, and Mundrabilla, previously observed UTC plus 945. Currently, these areas operate on UTC plus 845 due to Western Australia's lack of daylight savings time. Australia is not the only example of weird time zones. China has a population of approximately 1.5 billion people, and it's the third largest country in the world. Despite its vast size, China operates on a single time zone known as Beijing time or China Standard Time. This unique time zone covers almost five geographical time zones within the country. At times, in some cities in China, the sun rises as late as 10 a.m. People often have lunch after 2 p.m. or even after 4 p.m. if they're not in a hurry. Since 1991, daylight savings time has not been observed in China. However, the region of Xinjiang, located in the western part of the country, follows Xinjiang time, which is two hours behind China Standard Time and is considered an unofficial time zone. Nepal also has its unique time zone, as it operates on Nepal time all year round, without the use of daylight savings time. It's a bit unique compared to other countries because it has a UTC offset of plus 545, meaning that Nepali clocks are 5 hours and 45 minutes ahead of coordinated universal time. This is only a 15-minute difference from neighboring India, where the standard time used to be the same until Nepal decided to set its own time zone in 1956. Now, let's examine the map of Europe. Great Britain, Portugal, and Spain are all located at roughly the same latitude. However, despite this, it's one hour earlier in Portugal and the UK compared to Spain. Why is this the case? In the 1940s, Spain was instructed to switch to German time, a directive that was accepted by Spanish authorities. Over time, despite changes in leadership, Spain remained in the same time zone, resulting in it being one hour behind its neighboring countries at the same latitude. But like many other countries, Spain sticks to daylight savings time. Greenland would rank as the world's 12th largest country if it were independent, but it's currently part of Denmark. The country has three different time zones. Most of it is three hours behind Greenwich Mean Time, except for only one town on the eastern coast, which is two hours ahead. Thule Air Base in the northwest operates on GMT-4, while the tiny population of Danmarkshaven sticks to GMT. Daylight savings time was implemented to give us more daylight during the evenings after work, which could help save energy by lowering the need for lights and heat. It was first suggested by Benjamin Franklin in 1784 to align waking hours with daylight and conserve energy, and was implemented in Port Arthur, Ontario in 1906. 
Since then, many countries have adopted the practice. Though some regions near the equator or at high latitudes opt out due to minimal variations in daylight hours. In the United States, daylight savings time is observed almost everywhere except in Hawaii and Arizona. Arizona's scorching hot weather makes daylight saving time kind of pointless. People there would rather get stuff done in the cool morning hours than sweat it out in the evenings. However, the Navajo Nation, which is autonomous Native American territory, sticks to the same daylight savings time schedule as the rest of the country. Even though it spans three states, Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah, they keep the time consistent across their lands. As for Hawaii, due to its tropical location, the amount of sunlight doesn't change much throughout the year. If Hawaii changed its time zone to UTC-9 during daylight savings time, the sun would rise at around 7 a.m. in June. This is because most of the islands are situated towards the west of the Hawaii Aleutian time zone and theoretically should be in the next time zone to the west. In the past, Hawaiian standard time was based on a different longitude than it is now. You wake up gasping for air, struggling to peel yourself from your bed. When you do manage to get your feet on the ground, it feels like they're glued down tight. You're twice as heavy. It feels like you're carrying another you on your shoulders all day long. Well, congratulations. You've woken up on an Earth where uncontrolled experiments with dark matter have doubled the force of gravity. Mass panic happens when over 8,000 aircraft fall as soon as the gravity spikes crashing into buildings, forests, and oceans. And that's because airplanes suddenly lost the balance between the pull of gravity and the lift force necessary to keep them cruising. Pilots did attempt to save their planes, but GPS failed as satellites swiftly moved. After a month, humans begin to look more and more like chimps. Bones are getting thicker, and the immense force constantly pulling people down is squashing their spines, making everybody bend over. People start figuring out that walking ape-style on all fours helps with better balance and stability. And that becomes a big deal, since even tripping over a tiny rock could lead to a nasty fracture. Falls not only get more intense due to the extra forces on bones and joints, but they also happen faster. Gravity's pull doubles the acceleration force, increasing it from 32 feet per second to 64 feet per second. Your house is not a safe place anymore. Old buildings and bridges all over the world are now collapsing. Inside those still standing, residents get the scary feeling that the whole place is shaking, and cracks start showing up everywhere. It's dangerous to stay inside houses, as roofs are now twice their usual weight and any rain or snow also feels twice as heavy. Car alarms are constantly going off because tree branches keep falling all over the place. Most trees simply can't bear the weight of gravity, and only strong and small plants survive, like cactuses and succulents. Six months after the sudden change, supermarkets have a sinister vibe going on with shelves nearly empty and people arguing over the last loaf of bread. You get frustrated to see that your favorite Japanese restaurant is now five times more expensive. And it's not just about salmon prices. It's rice that has become a rare luxury item, since the gravity boost has messed up the photosynthesis process, and the seeds are taking too long to grow. On the flip side, carrots are now cheaper than ever. They're sprouting and growing at lightning speed. People start eating so many carrots that human skin now has an orange glow from all that extra beta-carotene. Farmers are getting creative, using artificial supports to keep plants like tomatoes and corn on their feet. But even with all their efforts, it's hard to get a good harvest. Summer has arrived, and even your air conditioner can't relieve the unbearable heat. A sudden change in gravity disrupted Earth's orbit around the Sun, pushing it into a new, tighter elliptical path. Earth now passes much closer to the Sun than it used to, making your sunscreen simply surrender. The Moon's orbit has also had some dramatic changes, leading to more dangerous and extreme tide patterns. High tides are now higher, and low tides are lower. The shift has also triggered widespread volcanic eruptions and earthquakes on an unprecedented scale. 
Earth's crust starts to rupture across vast areas, unleashing planet-wide lava flows so intense that living on Venus begins to sound like a pretty good idea. Five years later, people notice that puppies are begging for food twice as much, but they are taking more time to grow. Breeds like beagles look thinner and their leg bones are getting heavier. Even insects such as locusts now have thicker hind legs to keep those jumps going. Sea creatures are being crushed by the much greater weight of the water around them. That's not a big deal for animals used to deep ocean pressures, like the anglerfish. But crabs and lobsters are really struggling since they live in shallow waters. Sloths and monkeys develop a stronger grip so they won't fall off trees. For carnivorous animals living in jungles or savannas, life is a real challenge because any animal the size of a wolf or bigger can't run without breaking a leg. Large predators like lionesses are starving because they can't move fast enough to catch their prey. Tall trees like palms and pines also go through evolutionary changes. They get beefier trunks and only grow about half as tall as usual. This way, water and nutrients can travel from the ground up to their leaves without struggling against gravity so badly. Ten years have passed since gravity increased. Airlines have finally made changes to prevent commercial flights from nosediving. The wings of airplanes are now longer. Pilots have learned to fly at altitudes twice as high, and flight speed has increased by 41%. To avoid people getting extremely nauseated and dizzy during takeoffs and landings, seats are now fully horizontal, like first-class bed-like setups, specially designed to minimize the nasty effects of gravity times two. Flight attendants are trained to raise the seat at the passenger's feet after they pass out so that blood can return to their head. The thing is, when gravity gets a power boost, it yanks your blood down to your feet and hands even more than usual, making your heart work extra hard to pump that blood around, especially to your head. 50 years have passed. Women in their 30s look like they are 60. Higher gravity decreases collagen synthesis. So even though they're still young, they're dealing with more wrinkles and fine lines, and their skin has already lost a big part of its elasticity. Wounds as small as a pimple pop or a paper cut also take much more time to heal. So people are excited about the creation of a band-aid made from fish skin from cod or tilapia that promotes local blood circulation and speeds up the healing process. People have also got used to wear exoskeletons made of titanium, which support and enhance the wearer's strength. This technology features cool joints of the places that copy humans' natural movements, giving people more flexibility and letting them move around more easily. Prototypes of personal flying devices start popping up after 100 years. The gray flyer is like a jetpack made of carbon nanotubes, making the structure strong without adding much weight. Instead of using fuel for propulsion, the device has these super-thin but high-tech solar panels. Investors are still not sure if humans could fly long distances with it, but the gray flyer definitely can help people tackle tasks that have become almost impossible, like climbing a mountain or grabbing something from the attic. Things at the gym are pretty different, too. The anti-gravity treadmill is a favorite among fitness enthusiasts because it uses air pressure to lift users, reducing the discomfort of gravity while running. People can also lift weights in booths when the gravity settings are customized. When training with G-Force set at three or four times the new normal, muscles get stronger, making double gravity seem more bearable. However, the maximum set is 4.6, otherwise bones might crack. Over 500 years have passed. Thanks to these amazing technological creations, humans can now handle and establish colonies in other parts of the universe. A popular choice for family vacations is Kepler 452b, a planet about 60% larger than Earth, orbiting in the habitable zone of a sun-like star. Kids especially like that place, as oceans have been discovered and hotels have been built near rocky beaches. On the other hand, Traveling to places in the universe with lighter gravity is like going to an oasis of tranquility. So Mars and the Moon have become known for amazing yoga retreats. With their gravitational forces much weaker, people can breathe more easily there and move around with more freedom. 
Keep in mind that these trips are expensive, so you might want to start saving up now. Life originated in water, or so we always heard. In reality, it could have begun in ice. We know that it all started more than 3 billion years ago with simple microbes, and it's been evolving ever since. However, there are many theories about how exactly it happened. Maybe not heat, but cold was the beginning of everything. Cells were the first tiny life forms. But before we had fully developed cells, there were simpler things that couldn't survive on their own. Certain important chemicals for life, like the mentioned amino acids, usually float in water in tiny amounts. First, they needed something to help them stay together without spreading all over the place. Otherwise, they would have gotten lost in the sea. And second, they needed to stick together in groups to form more complex things. Moreover, when they started to form in groups, they started the process of evolution. They chose the best molecules to do specific tasks and kicked out the faulty ones. Without this organization, the fastest replicators, or parasites, would have taken over. There were several ways they could organize themselves. Three billion years ago, oceans were covered in ice. And it turned out that certain important chemicals for life, such as amino acids and nucleic acids, are more stable in colder temperatures. When water freezes, these chemicals that hang out in the oceans get packed together, making it easier for life to form. Or maybe what helped them were special spots called hydrothermal vents. Imagine the deepest, darkest parts of the ocean floor where hot water shoots out from cracks in the Earth's crust. Life might have started right there, in these extreme conditions. These vents spew out important elements like carbon and hydrogen, which are crucial for life. As the superheated water travels through the Earth's crust, it picks up other important stuff like minerals. When it finally bursts out of the vents, it creates a kind of soup rich in chemicals. In the rocky crevices around these vents, all these molecules could have come together and sparked the first signs of life. The hot, mineral-rich environment acted like a kitchen to cook the first recipes ever for living things. Even today, these vents are home to vibrant ecosystems, showing that life can thrive in extreme conditions. Ancient stories also talk about life starting from clay. It turns out that this idea has a scientific basis, too. Imagine tiny particles of clay, like little grains of sand, sticking together in a structured way. As they grow and get bigger, they keep their original shape intact. They form bigger areas and clumps. They become kind of like patches, clay clumps with tiny holes inside. Each patch may be exposed to different things in the environment, like different chemicals or substances. When these outside molecules go through the clay, they get trapped along the way. Once trapped, these molecules get organized in specific patterns within the clay. This process is compared to how our genes organize things. Just like genes tell our bodies how to arrange different parts, the clay patches organize molecules. This theory was created back in the 80s, although it was very controversial at the time. We need more investigation to figure out whether this is true or not. Ancient people could have been onto something when they said that we all started with Zeus's lightning. Life itself is a chemical reaction, and it needs energy. Without energy, nothing happens. Cells are the building blocks of life. You can picture these cells as tiny factories bustling with activity, constantly working to keep you alive. Just like every factory needs a power source to keep its machines running smoothly, they need energy to do their job. In the world of cells, that power source is something called ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate. It's an organic molecule. There are also some backup generators with fancy names like theoesters, acyl phosphates, and reduced ferrodoxin. 
they basically work like extra boosts. When life first started, it needed energy to make complex stuff like proteins and DNA. Back then, this energy came from the environment. It could be light, heat, chemicals, or even lightning. That lightning might have kick-started life. Back in the 1950s, scientists did something called the Miller-Urey experiment. They zapped a mix of gases that mimicked Earth's early atmosphere with electric sparks. Suddenly, that caused amino acids and sugars, the basic stuff of life, to pop out. All living things share a special code called DNA, the genetic code. It's one of the oldest and most important things about life. And we think this code existed in the very first forms of life too. This code is quite tricky. It involves putting the right building blocks, amino acids, together in the right order. And there are special molecules called tRNA and mRNA that help with this process. The early version of this code was probably simpler than what we have now. It might have used shorter instructions like using just two letters instead of three. Scientists are still figuring out how DNA first appeared at all. Some think it might have started alongside metabolism, where certain molecules helped put the right building blocks together. Now. They think that the secret to understanding how DNA and proteins are formed lies in looking at RNA. RNA is a versatile player, a molecule that can do some of the jobs of both DNA and proteins. In the past, it could have been the star before DNA and proteins took over. And even though they're the main players now, RNA still has important roles in living things. For example, it can switch genes on and off, controlling how cells behave. But then comes the next question. How did RNA come to be? Well, we need to look for even simpler origins. RNA are big and complicated molecules, but life could have begun with smaller ones bumping into each other and starting chemical reactions. These reactions might have happened inside tiny capsules that acted like cell membranes. Over time, they might have evolved into more complex ones that could do the job better. In other words, life could have started with a basic recipe and slowly added more ingredients. Every living thing is made of carbon. Carbon is an essential life block. It's the stuff that makes molecules. And they form cells tissues, and organs. Earth was very different many years ago. There were no plants or trees, and the air was different too. Instead of the oxygen we breathe now, there were gases like hydrogen, nitrogen, hydrogen sulfide, and of course, carbon dioxide, which contained carbon. In this ancient world, life might have started in a way where organisms didn't eat other organisms for energy. Perhaps they made their own food from these simple chemicals. They could eat this carbon dioxide, kind of like plants do today, and this is where they receive their carbon from. We call this autotrophic origin. They think that certain metals like iron and nickel, along with minerals containing them, played a big role in this process. These metals and minerals acted like assistants, helping chemical reactions happen that were important for life to begin. They were found all over the Earth back then, especially in places where there wasn't much oxygen. And finally, we have a wild theory that life didn't start on Earth at all. It could have been brought to us from somewhere else. Rocks from Mars sometimes get blasted into space by big cosmic collisions. Some of these rocks have ended up on Earth, carrying tiny microbes with them. So maybe, while we search for life on Mars, it could have been the red planet that started our very own life. Or maybe it wasn't Mars. Others suggest that life might have hitched a ride on comets from other star systems, traveling through space until they landed here. But if life did come from somewhere else, it just raises more questions. For example, 
How did life start in space in the first place? This is why scientists are a bit skeptical about this idea, which is called panspermia. In any case, the origins of life are a huge mystery, and we'll need decades of research to figure out the full answer. A magnitude 15 earthquake has the potential to completely destroy our planet and evaporate all the water in a matter of seconds, leaving Earth uninhabitable. Over half a million earthquakes happen annually, but none have a magnitude of 15. 90% of quakes occur in the terrifying Ring of Fire zone located around the Pacific Ocean. The ground there is like jello. It shakes almost constantly. The most powerful earthquake to have ever struck Earth had a magnitude of 9.5. That much power can lengthen or shorten the day. But there's probably an earthquake in the confines of your own home now caused by a speck of dust landing on a table but it has a power of negative 15 magnitudes. Earthquakes happen when tectonic plates move. They're like Lego pieces that are not properly secured, and when they move up, down, or hit one another, the ground also moves, triggering earthquakes. This tectonic energy acts like a battery. It stores energy for a long time, up to 500 years. When this stored energy is released in a sudden burst, the consequences are horrifying. Even the strongest structures submit to this relentless force that leaves a trail of destruction in its path. In some instances, earthquakes can even trigger tsunamis, amplifying the chaos. Such a crazy amount of power can split the ground open and cause severe damage. The strength of an earthquake is measured by the Richter scale, but now it's being replaced by the moment magnitude scale. When there's an earthquake, we hear about how strong it is. It's usually from 1 to 10. Luckily, we haven't had a Richter scale earthquake yet. The most powerful earthquake to have ever happened in modern history occurred in Chile in the 60s. It was around 9.5 on the Richter scale, and it altered Earth's rotation and messed up the length of the day by around 2 milliseconds. It also triggered a massive tsunami and affected a vast area of 155,000 square miles. The Richter scale doesn't actually have a limit. Still, anything above 25 doesn't need measuring because if that ever happened, we would simply turn into dust and nobody would care to measure this disaster. As we said, the strongest earthquake had a magnitude of 9.5. If this magnitude had been just 0.5 stronger, it would have created a ruptured line 2,174 miles long. That is almost seven times the size of Wyoming. A magnitude 11 earthquake would create a crack halfway around the world. Massive tsunamis would hit coastal areas, destroying everything, and Earth would get into a massive environmental crisis. If you love hiking, you would have new mountains to explore, created by the terrifying earthquake. Even the temperature would increase because of volcanic eruptions and the resulting greenhouse gases. It would turn our planet into a hot oven. The safest places would be far away from any buildings, seas, oceans, and mountains where there would be a low chance of a landslide. Countries unprepared for earthquakes would be totally destroyed, and cities would turn into piles of rubble and dust. Going up on the Richter scale would only make things worse. But don't worry, an earthquake of that power is impossible. Earth's crust doesn't have enough energy to produce such earthquakes. But there is something that has much more power and can produce mega earthquakes. Asteroids are powerful enough to destroy our planet, as we all know from the dinosaur era. That asteroid was around 6 miles long and it caused massive damage to the planet. It triggered earthquakes that shook the ground constantly for months. These terrifying quakes were about 50,000 times stronger than the Chile earthquake. They also triggered a tsunami that was 30,000 times more powerful than the Indian Ocean tsunami. And the latter was one of the most devastating tsunamis to have ever struck Earth. The earthquakes caused by the asteroid had a magnitude of 11, making it the most powerful and scariest natural disaster ever. And let's hope it stays that way. The Indian Ocean tsunami affected only certain areas of the world. Meanwhile, the asteroid tsunami affected every part of the world and had 33-foot-tall waves. 
Even if you had traveled to the most remote place on Earth, you wouldn't have been able to hide from this Grim Reaper. A 15 magnitude earthquake wouldn't be 15% stronger than the Chile earthquake. The scale doesn't work like that. It would be around 100 million times more powerful than a 9.5 magnitude quake. It could make all the water on Earth evaporate, leaving us devastated and without any H2O to survive. All ecosystems would collapse, all food chains would be broken, and only some super strong bacteria would probably survive the impossible. That is only a fraction of the frightening things that could happen. The ocean is like the AC for our planet. Without it, Earth would be super hot. The ocean also serves as a shield from the sun's powerful rays. It acts as a heat absorber and cools Earth. Scientists think that the most dangerous thing would be the inability of Earth's crust to survive the violent shakes of the 15 magnitude earthquake. If our planet miraculously survived and didn't turn into dust, there would be massive openings in its crust. The ground would become gelatinous. It would randomly move up, down, left and right, and no building would survive that. Our civilization would be brought back to the Stonehenge era. Tectonic movements like this are devastating. A similar thing happened in Japan when tectonic plates moved 165 feet from each other and then snapped back together, creating a 9-magnitude earthquake. No place on Earth is immune to this bone-chilling natural phenomenon. Still, certain places have higher chances of being destroyed than others, like the Ring of Fire, where 90% of earthquakes happen. This is a place where earthquakes are almost everyday occurrences. The Ring of Fire is located in the Pacific Ocean. It forms a ring around the continents that surround the Pacific. There, several tectonic plates meet, creating highly unstable ground. To make the problem much more terrifying, 75% of active volcanoes are located in this area. 90% of dormant volcanoes are also there, making this place extremely dangerous. Scientists carefully study this region to find a way to predict when the next earthquake might strike. The Ring of Fire is not the only place at risk of earthquakes. In California, along the San Andreas fault line, two tectonic plates have been storing power for more than 200 years. The San Andreas Fault is 715 miles long and has the potential for a massive earthquake. This region has its fear of violent earthquakes like the one that happened in San Francisco in 1906. It had a magnitude of 7.8 on the Richter scale. Scientists' predictions are terrifying. They say that the chance of a 6.7 magnitude earthquake is very high in the area. If all hell starts to break loose, you should know how to survive. Avoid anything that might fall on you, like windows, closets, or unstable ceilings. The official phrase from emergency experts is, drop, cover, and hold on. Stay low to the ground, hide under something stable like a table, and remain there until the shaking stops. Make sure to stay in your shelter for another minute or two, just in case there are aftershocks or loose debris. Use your nose and smell for gas. If you do smell it, don't turn the lights on or do anything that might ignite it. Stay strong and be safe. Now, imagine a place where a single day lasts longer than a whole year. On Venus, a day, meaning one full spin on its axis, is as long as 243 Earth days. And what's even weirder, despite the fact that Venus is experiencing a never-ending day, it has a shorter year than Earth. While Earth takes about 365 days to complete one orbit around the Sun, Venus does it in just 225 days. So, somehow, for Venus, a day is more epic than a whole year. Venus is a strange planet in general. It's called Earth's twin because of how alike we are, although it's a bit smaller than Earth. But there are some drastic differences, too. For example, it spins in the opposite direction, which means the sun there rises in the west and sets in the east. And Venus isn't the only one who dances to its own rhythm. Uranus does that too. And finally, Venus is quite crazy in terms of its atmosphere. When you stand on Earth, you don't really feel the weight of the air around you. Well, on Venus, that feeling would be like having an elephant sitting on your shoulders. Venus has 90 times the atmospheric pressure of Earth. The atmosphere there is a thick layer of toxic gases. For example, carbon dioxide that's released by all the volcanoes. 
it presses down with incredible force. This results in very hot temperatures. No wonder it'll take a long time before we'll be able to stand on this planet. Meanwhile, Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun, has an even more speedy orbit than Venus. It completes a full journey around the Sun in just about 88 Earth days. However, it has a slow spin on its axis, which means that one day on Mercury takes about 176 Earth days, basically half a year. Just like with Venus, a day there takes much longer than a year. Since it's closest to the Sun, no wonder Mercury experiences some super-extreme temperature swings. Daytime temperatures can soar up to a scorching 800 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead. But wait for the sunset. At night, it drops to freezing minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit. Ooh. That's because Mercury doesn't have a thick atmosphere like we do, so the heat doesn't distribute across the planet evenly. If one side is in the dark, it'll be super cold and the other side will be scorching hot, just like if you let a regular big rock lie down under the sun for a while. In fact, it's so cold that there might even be some ice on it. Look at the planet's north polar region, especially those sunlit yellow spots inside craters. These are indications of water ice. Turns out water is much more common in space than we thought. Mars is often dubbed the red planet. It earns this nickname from the abundance of iron oxide, or rust, covering its surface. The iron-rich minerals create a rusty red hue that paints the Martian landscape. But it turns out, Mars isn't just red. If you were standing on Mars, you'd witness desert-like butterscotch terrain with caramel and golden glows, some brown, and even a glimpse of a slight greenish hue. Mars also has the biggest mountain in the entire solar system, Olympus Mons standing at a staggering height of about 13.6 miles tall. It's even taller than Mount Everest. It was formed by the volcanic eruption yielding low-viscosity lava, creating a shield-like structure. Since Mars is covered in sand, it's also famous for its crazy dust storms. But it turns out they're even more insane than we thought. These storms can last for months. While they might present challenges for future human missions, they also contribute to the planet's mesmerizing appearance when observed from afar. And not only storms, but even its own Mars quakes. Also known as seismic tremors, they were first detected by NASA in 2019. Unlike earthquakes that are often triggered by tectonic plate movements, Martian quakes are thought to result from the cooling and contracting of the planet's interior. It's interesting how similar, yet how different the planets are. Saturn's iconic rings might hold a secret link to Earth's ancient past. The rings are composed mainly of ice particles and debris and are estimated to be relatively young in space terms, perhaps just a few hundred million years old. Now, there are some theories that propose that they were born after some catastrophic event. For example, the collision of two large moons or the breakup of a comet. What's interesting is that this timeline coincides with the age of the dinosaur's demise on Earth. Could there be a connection? <laughs> Who knows? By the way, while Saturn takes the crown for its rings, it's not the only planet in our solar system sporting them. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune all have their own set of rings, although they might not be as visible and cool as Saturn's. However, there's something where Saturn truly stands out – the magnificent hexagon at its north pole. It's a colossal six-sided figure. Each side of this incredible structure measures around 9,000 miles long, which is 1,200 miles longer than the Earth's diameter. Scientists aren't sure how it was formed or why. They think it might be due to varying wind speeds. Or maybe it's shaped by a localized, slow, meandering jet stream. So far, it remains another of Saturn's mysteries. Much like Saturn's hexagon, Jupiter also has its own weird spot. It's called the Great Red Spot. This is a storm that's been raging for at least 350 years and is larger than Earth itself. Despite its name, the spot's coloration has varied over the years, ranging from brick red to pale salmon. Scientists continue to study this enduring storm, unlocking the mysteries of its persistence and ever-changing hues. Meteorologically, the Great Red Spot is a powerhouse. It generates enormous pressure in Jupiter's southern hemisphere. Meanwhile, Jupiter itself is a powerhouse when it comes to magnetic fields. 
Its magnetic influence is colossal. It extends far beyond the planet itself and creates one of the largest and strongest magnetic fields in our solar system. Because of that, Jupiter is a source of intense radiation and mesmerizing auroras. While Earth's northern lights are breathtaking, Jupiter has something to offer too. The magnetic field interacts with charged particles from Jupiter's moons and the solar wind. This creates visually striking auroras near its poles. But compared to Earth, the scale of these auroras is incredible, like nothing we've seen on our planet. But even having a cool big spot isn't a unique feature in our solar system. A stormy giant Neptune, the eighth and farthest planet from the Sun, also has its great dark spot. Just like Jupiter, it's a massive vortex in Neptune's atmosphere. But unlike its Jupiter counterpart, this spot tends to come and go because of Neptune's dynamic and ever-changing weather patterns. Neptune, together with Uranus, is known as an ice giant. And just like other giants, it boasts some of the most ferocious winds in our solar system. Its supersonic winds can get faster than 2,200 miles per hour. What a drama queen! But this explains its thick cloud formations. By the way, if you ever dreamed of a planet raining diamonds, you might want to visit this planet. Deep within Neptune's atmosphere, where pressures are extreme, scientists theorize that carbon atoms are compressed and form diamonds. And then, these diamonds might be raining down. What a unique touch to stormy weather! Neptune's moons got from their parent with the weird weather. For example, its largest moon, Triton, has a touch of cryovolcanism. Instead of spewing molten rock like Earth's volcanoes, Triton's cryovolcanoes erupt with a mix of water, ammonia, and nitrogen. Picture it as icy geysers shooting material into space. Seems like, in our solar system alone, each planet has its own quirks and interesting qualities. Let's hope that we discover some more interesting things in outer space in the future. If one of the many apocalyptic scenarios come true and humanity is wiped out completely, a black box will tell whoever comes after us about what has led to that scary day. The 33-foot-long vault in a remote part of western Tasmania is supposed to document all the mistakes humanity has made that led to an apocalypse. The artists, architects, and researchers behind the Earth's black box hope that the art installation made of thick reinforced steel will withstand fire, water, and any other natural disasters, except probably for total planetary destruction. Just like the black box you can find in planes, this time capsule is supposed to help the next civilization do better and avoid the probable sad and tragic fate of our humanity. The project is fully non-commercial and has an important message. The box will be full of storage drives and have access to the internet. Solar panels on the roof will power it, and batteries will take care of backup power storage. Whenever the sun's out, the black box will be updating itself with new scientific data. A special algorithm will sort it only to save the information relevant to the project. It will be measurements of land and sea temperatures, ocean acidification, species extinction, land use changes, as well as data on human population and energy consumption. The second type of data for the box will be newspaper headlines, social media posts, and news from the key global events focusing on the environment. The creators of the box decided to encode and store data for it in several formats, including binary code. The instructions on how to retrieve all that priceless knowledge would be etched into the outside of the box. Some of the big brains involved in the project are afraid that this could inspire some curious bad guys to break into the box long before it's time to do it. The solar-powered hard drive will have enough space to collect data over 50 years. Even the most pessimistic scientific models don't predict the end of the world any sooner anyway. It might even take centuries before the worst happens. The idea of a box that would record everything that happened before an accident in aviation was born in the middle of the 20th century. Back then, the world's first jetliner, de Havilland's Comet, crashed seven times over two years, taking the lives of 110 people. 
The Department of Civil Aviation in Australia wanted to find the possible cause of all these crashes. One of these experts was Dr. David Warren, a chemist specializing in aviation fuels. He realized that there was simply not enough data to make any conclusions. There was no one to tell what had really happened before the crash. He remembered seeing a dictaphone that recorded sound on steel wire at a trade fair. Soon, Dr. Warren wrote a memo to his manager offering to design a voice recorder to follow what was going on in the cockpit. It would also record flight data and be stored in a crash-proof container. Flying wasn't a huge thing in Australia back then, so the manager didn't appreciate the idea. Dr. Warren then started working on a prototype in his own garage. He showed the ready device to the secretary of the British Air Registration Board when he was in Australia. He absolutely loved the idea. So later, Dr. Warren got a whole team to help him develop a pre-production prototype. The correct way to call his invention is actually not black box, but flight data recorder. And it's orange, not black. We probably call it black because those gadgets get charred black after a crash. Or maybe because the first boxes were painted that color to prevent reflection. Or because that's the general name scientists use for devices with in and output of data with complex internal workings. So, the flight data recorder consists of two parts. The data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder. Historically, they were two boxes, but now they're just two cylinders. The data recorder keeps track of such important flight data as engine exhaust, temperature, fuel flow, aircraft velocity, altitude, and rate of descent. The second part records sound in the cockpit to analyze communication with air traffic control in case of an accident. The device only records data for up to two hours and then overwrites the previous sounds. Sometimes, the two parts are combined and they look like a box. The devices record data and voices from the cockpit, but they are actually located in the tail end of the aircraft, where the structure of the plane will protect them best in case of a crash. The black box has a locator beacon, which is activated when water gets on it, but it will send out a pulse for 30 days. Search parties use the bright orange color of the recorder as a visual beacon. Sometimes, it takes a long time to find the box, and in some cases, they don't find it at all. Long before the first plane was invented, there was an original black box of planetary meaning, the ancient library of Alexandria. Back in the ancient days, people in places like Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Greece were no strangers to libraries and archives. But these early institutions were more about preserving local traditions and heritage. The whole concept of a universal library only became a thing when the Greeks started thinking big. They were so impressed by what their neighbors in Egypt were doing that they arranged expeditions to acquire knowledge. Alexander the Great, the king of Macedonia, seeing that hunger for knowledge required his companions, generals, and scholars to report to him in detail on regions that were previously unmapped. It helped collect plenty of information on geography and contributed to the creation of a great library. Most of the information it had was written in Greek. It had the books of Aristotle as part of the whole corpus of Greek literature. Some sources say that in the hunt for new books, the library's founders would stop every ship sailing into the harbor of Alexandria. If they found books, they would take them to the library. If they decided it was valuable, they'd make a quick copy and return it to the owner with some compensation, leaving the original at the library. Another story tells us that Ptolemy III, grandson of the founder of the library, offered the governors of Athens a huge compensation to copy the original texts of the greatest poets. He then kept the originals and sent them back copies. Once the Roman Empire arrived, they burnt all that knowledge, not thinking that it might lead to their own collapse. There was no easy way of spreading information across the world, so one source had most of the knowledge humanity had accumulated by then. The great minds of those times didn't just fill it with knowledge, but also made important connections, trying to make the best use of that information. 
If the Library of Alexandria hadn't burnt, we could have gotten some priceless knowledge about the people who had lived before the current era. Some scientists believe that big data could have saved the Vikings that had settled in Greenland many centuries ago. It might have also helped the Easter Island civilization to identify and address problems caused by volcanic activity, latitude, and rainfall patterns, and restore soil fertility. They say that a typical person living today is exposed to as much data in one day as someone in the 15th century would learn in their entire lifetime. And there's a theory that every papyrus scroll on the whole Library of Alexandria could probably fit onto an ordinary flash drive you have in your pocket. There's so much big data generated every day that it might do us more harm than good because of a huge information overload. We're moving towards a global civilization, so if all that knowledge disappears, we lose not one empire, but the entire world. Surprise! There's more than seven continents on our planet. Argoland, a hidden continent, may help us understand how our planet will look in the future. To find out how it hid from us and what secrets it holds, well, you'll just have to keep watching. Ready for a mystery? Scientists have been looking for a piece of land that's been missing for over 100 million years. Not exactly newsworthy, since people search for information about our planet's history all the time. You'd think it was probably this minuscule island somewhere in the middle of an ocean. Well, you'd be wrong, because this continent used to be as big as the entire U.S. territory. For a long time, geologists have been wondering whether a massive chunk of contemporary Australia vanished into thin air. Some believed it was simply hiding somewhere on the ocean floor. But thanks to some Dutch specialists and seven years of investigating, we now know there are bits and pieces of this lost land mixed underneath the lush jungles of Southeast Asia. The continents we see in our geography manuals these days are like scattered pieces of a puzzle. There's even a nice experiment you can conduct to see for yourself. Find a world map online and print it out. Cut out all of the continents and play around with them for a while. You'll see they all fit together. Probably the most striking thing you'll see is how South America perfectly fits near Africa. If you close up the oceans that were formed in the last 200 million years, the continents look like they form a giant letter C. And that C is what scientists call the supercontinent Pangaea. It was swimming in an ocean called Panthalosset, and the inner portion of that letter C had a smaller stretch of water called the Tethys Ocean. It is in this small ocean where things get interesting. Back in the Jurassic period, this vanished continent, which scientists started calling Argoland, vanished and left a hole in Australia, now known as the Argo Abyssal Plain. Geologists initially believed this was all due to a process called subduction. It's when one piece of the Earth's crust dives under another and recycles it into the planet's mantle. Usually, specialists track this continental vanishing through off-scraping. That's how they figured out, for instance, that India bumped into Asia and gave us the majestic Himalayan mountains. But for Argoland, things were a bit more complicated. Bits and pieces were popping up in places like Myanmar and Indonesia. But they behave like these time-traveling relics, looking way older than when Argoland supposedly separated from Australia. It immediately raised the question. If one continent can behave so weirdly, how many others are out there doing the same? Thankfully, scientists have now put together the entire timeline of Argoland and figured out its mystery. It didn't sink or get swallowed up. It simply transformed into an Argopelago, breaking into smaller pieces called microcontinents and floating away from Australia. These mini continents then took a little journey before settling down in Southeast Asian jungles. This discovery fits right into the whole Pangaea puzzle. It helps us better understand how continents break up and make up, all in one discovery, revealing secrets of biodiversity and climate back from in the day. If you'd like to find out more secrets about history, civilization, or random day-to-day -day objects, be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Like, for instance, the mystery behind this invisible species line in Indonesia. It's called the Wallace Line, 
named after the British explorer Alfred Russell Wallace. Over 150 years ago, Wallace was on a journey around the Malay archipelago, visiting thousands of islands. What he found was that animals on one side of this invisible line were considerably different from ones on the other side. This invisible line is like a wall between marsupials and tigers, for instance, or honey eaters and trogons. But now we know that around 35 million years ago, Australia broke up with Antarctica and collided with Asia. And this continental love triangle triggered significant changes. It didn't just change the way the land looked, it also messed with the species of animals on each side of the Wallace line. In more recent times, a bunch of specialists published a study saying this collision and climate chaos made Asian species comfy living in the Malay archipelago. Meanwhile, the Aussie animals weren't as happy with the new environment. It was too hot and wet for some, and others just couldn't handle the tropical island lifestyle. The discovery of this continental shift towards Asia might also explain a recent finding of a human species that didn't seem to make any sense either. You see, in this hidden cave in the Philippines, archaeologists stumbled upon a new human ancestor. It seems that about 50,000 years ago, on the island of Luzon, there was this ancient human-like species. The lead researcher believed this finding was crucial for understanding human evolution in Asia, and it named this new species after the island, Homo luzonensis. Now, here's where it gets a bit confusing. The bones found by archaeologists had one small problem. They had a weird mix of traits that hadn't been seen together in any other hominid species. Smaller teeth, similar to ours, yet hands and feet that were more like our ancient humanoid ancestors. It was those throwback limbs in particular that connected this human species with the long-lost southern territory. That's because they have this primitive look, like these hard-to-pronounce guys, for instance. Only these two species are separated by 2-3 to three million years of time and evolution. Many have wondered, is Homo luzonensis really a new species? Not everyone is convinced. But it may also explain why living creatures are also affected by the constant shifting of the land underneath us. Now, just because they haven't changed much during our lifetime, it doesn't mean our continents will look like this forever. They evolve from this large megacontinent, and they'll most likely end up in a similar position in the future. On that note, a geologist from a European university tried to predict the future of Earth's supercontinents. As a starting point, he used an earthquake that occurred in Portugal back in 1755, when tectonic plates behaved a bit differently than they should have. After years of research, he came up with a theory in 2016. He believed that the stitches between these tectonic plates might be coming apart, setting the stage for a bigger rupture. It's like when glass cracks between two holes in a car windshield. If this happens, a subduction zone could stretch from the Mediterranean all the way up past Ireland, bringing volcanoes, earthquakes, and new mountains to these areas. If all goes according to this plan, the Atlantic Ocean will disappear, and so will the Pacific, turning into one large stretch of water. Instead of the seven continents we know today, we'll get a new supercontinent, which he called Arica, because it would have Australia and the Americas at its heart. Now, it's not the only possible scenario, though. Novo Pangaea might be another, and it's easy to foresee. The Atlantic stays open and the Pacific closes. Then there's Amasia. For this one, you'd have to imagine the Arctic Ocean closing and the Atlantic and Pacific staying open. Everything shifts to the north around the North Pole, except Antarctica. One final scenario would be called Pangaea Ultima slow down the spreading in the Atlantic, and a new subduction plate pops up on the America's east coast. Well, either way, if all the continents collide in the future once more, some say it won't be fun to experience. It's believed that in around 250 million years, we'll feel like we're being trapped in a sweltering, soggy plastic bag. Weirdly, that bag will be the best place to live on Earth, the coastal areas. As for the inland spots, they'll be sizzling like a desert on fire. Many of the species of animals we know today might not make it. As for us humans, we'll need to be creative if we want to withstand the heat. We should be thankful, though, 
these digital models are still great because we can use them to test all sorts of interesting ideas. For example, how these supercontinents would mess with tides. Taking future space travels into consideration, these models can help us understand the climates of exoplanets too. Those are located outside our solar system. You may not have known this, but the Earth once had rings. Usually, Saturn is the planet that comes to mind when we think about rings. However, once upon a time, Earth could have had its own band of dusty particles. It was due to a phenomenon called ring ray, really. Our planet was surrounded by lots of little rocks and dust, perhaps the remnants of a hypothesized ancient planet, Theia. This protoplanet could have existed in the early solar system, and scientists assume that one day it could have collided with the early Earth. In that case, huge remnants of this collision would form our precious moon, and smaller rocks would result in the rings. In any case, the particles were pulled toward Earth's surface by gravity. All this happened around 4.5 billion years ago, shortly after Earth's formation. We know about them thanks to various sources. For example, we found some tiny glass beads in ancient rocks, which might have formed due to intense heat during ring particles' entry into Earth's atmosphere. We also found things like traces of isotopes in ancient rocks. Now, these rings would be much smaller than Saturn's, though, and weren't icy like Saturn's, so they weren't glowing. Our rings were mostly made of rock and dust. Scientists believe that they started around 620 miles above sea level, extending to the Roche limit. They'd be farther away from Earth than our International Space Station and most satellites. From the equator, the rings look like a straight line across the sky. But if you move north or south, they widen, creating a celestial arc. Near the North Pole, they would gain a subtle twilight effect. But unlike Saturn's rings that endure, Earth's were fleeting. Blame the sun! Earth's proximity caused water ice particles, potential ring makers, to turn into gas, leaving no bling behind. Ultraviolet light from the sun stripped away the rest. But what if Earth kept those rings? Imagine seeing this celestial spectacle day and night. Visually, it would be stunning, floating elegantly above our planet. During the day, we'd be adorned with their shimmer, and at night, they would be so bright and mesmerizing that they would even outshine the full moon. However, their impact on our lives wouldn't be that cool. First of all, the luminosity reflected off the rings might confuse nocturnal creatures, like dung beetles or swallow-tailed gulls. They're guided by the starlight, so poor creatures would be very confused by all this extra glow. This would disrupt their natural behaviors. The shadow cast by the rings could mess with our weather patterns as well. It would affect sunlight levels and pose a challenge for photosynthesis. Temperatures on the planet would change depending on the thickness and composition of the rings. They would impact our seasons and, potentially, cause even cooler winters and hotter summers. Satellites in Earth orbit might have faced some chaos as well. Space rocks hurtling at them could spell trouble for our high-tech companions. Perhaps things would be better if we kept them initially and evolved with them already existing, adapted to them. But if they suddenly appeared right now, it would cause tons of problems. Well, good thing that only Saturn has rings now. Or maybe not only Saturn. Its glowing bands and the famous Cassini division are visible even through a small telescope or binoculars of an amateur astronomer. They're super old and might have formed back at the times when dinosaurs roamed Earth. But in reality, all four giant planets in our solar system Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have them. Their stunning sets of rings are composed of tons of tiny dust particles, a mix of rocks and ice, ranging from tiny bits to sizes as big as a house. It varies from planet to planet, and each of them has its own material makeup. To find out more about this makeup, we can simply look at them. Some particles are as tiny as sand grains, while others are as big as double-decker buses. We also look at how reflective they are and how much they sparkle. Saturn's rings, for example, are mostly water ice, and they look like sparkly frozen droplets. Jupiter's rings, however, are more dusty with fine rocky particles, similar to asteroids. Uranus keeps its ring material a secret, but it's dark and not so sparkly. 
hinting it's not water ice. Instead, it could be carbon, or carbon-containing dust, maybe even charcoal. And Neptune takes it up a notch. Its rings are even darker, suggesting superfine dust, maybe carbon or methane ice. Scientists also study what sort of light these particles emit. They split this light into a spectra and look at the ring's secrets. For example, water ice, iron, and organic tholins are given the rings a reddish tint. And these giants are not the only ones in the universe who have this cool feature. For example, there's a planet way beyond our solar system called j 1407 b It has rings 200 times wider than Saturn's, and it looks insane. The planet was called Super Saturn by NASA. On the other end, there's an object with only two tiny rings called 10,199 Car Iclo. If the Super Saturn is most likely a giant with huge gravity, then this thing is very tiny. It's not even a planet. It's the so-called centaur, which is what we call small celestial bodies. In the case of faraway planets, usually we find their rings thanks to radio waves. All planets or satellites send out radio signals. When these signals pass through the rings around them, it results in a weird and pretty crazy symphony. The size and weight of particles in the rings decide the notes. For example, lighter particles, like aluminum, have their own groove, which is different from iron's. Now, the true mystery is how they're formed at all. Each of the planets in our solar system has its own ring history. In Saturn's case, scientists thought that maybe it had some huge moon, and then this moon broke apart for some reason, after a collision, for example, resulting in fascinating rocky bands. But if we sum up all the rocks, they don't result in a big enough object. So that theory most likely isn't true. They might have appeared because of the collision, but between some other objects. Jupiter's faint rings come from dust particles flung into orbit by micrometeorites. Neptune has not really rings, but rather arcs. They're not complete circles around a planet, but just parts of the circle. They're influenced by the gravitational pull of the moon Galatea. And finally, Uranus's mysterious rings, like red and blue ones, puzzle scientists. We have no idea where they came from. Same with Super Saturn and a centaur we mentioned before. The rings in our solar system have their own future. The sad truth is that Saturn will lose its iconic rings one day. NASA's Cassini spacecraft showed that they're slowly being pulled into the planet by gravity and magnetic fields. It happened so fast that Saturn's ring ring could fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool every half hour. So one day, what was once a spectacular sight stretching 22 times the length of Earth will shrink to almost nothing, becoming just a tiny part of Saturn. But hey, don't worry, despite the speed, it will take about 1 to 300 million years for all the rings to fully vanish. But there's an upside. Mars might gain its own rings one day, although it will take a long time too. In the next 30 to 50 million years, Mars could witness its moon Phobos breaking apart and forming a dazzling band around the planet. The pieces that don't contribute to the ring will create craters on the Martian surface. So let's hope we won't live on this planet by that time. Scientists in NASA hope to study the rings of different planets better in the future. In the meantime, the James Webb Space Telescope will keep scanning and analyzing them. Let's hope that we'll learn more about their mysteries and our solar system's history. If you've ever driven over the Rocky Mountains, you've probably seen road signs for the Continental Divide, the backbone of North America. All watersheds to the west of it run into the Pacific Ocean, and everything on its eastern slope goes straight into the Atlantic. There's just one creek in Wyoming that couldn't choose one side and drains into both oceans at the same time. Two Ocean Creek begins its journey high up in the Teton Range, the snow-capped peaks provide the perfect backdrop as the creek starts its descent, winding its way through alpine meadows and dense forests. As the creek continues its course, it gets to the Two Ocean Pass. This is the geographical crossroads where the creek splits into two branches, the Atlantic Creek and Pacific Creek. The Pacific Creek goes westward, 
and becomes part of the larger Snake River watershed, bringing its waters to the Snake River, which eventually merges with the Columbia River and, finally, reaches the Pacific Ocean. The Atlantic Creek heads eastward and flows into the Yellowstone, Missouri, and Mississippi rivers and eventually empties into the Gulf of Mexico. If you connect the two creeks' watersheds on a map, you'll get a single blue line between Oregon and Louisiana. Explorers struggling to find the Northwest Passage between the two oceans never knew they could have used the creek. They would just have to use really tiny boats. Some scientists believe that cutthroat trout had better luck in that way. They managed to migrate from the Snake River to Yellowstone River, most likely using the Two Ocean Creek. Technically, fish can travel over 6,000 miles to cover the whole distance from sea to shining sea in fresh water. The creek could be just perfect for that journey. There are hiking trails in Grand Teton National Park that lead to Two Ocean Pass. If you feel adventurous enough, you can stand at the literal crossroads of the continent and see the beginning of two aquatic journeys. Lonar Lake in India popped up literally out of nowhere around 52,000 years ago. Newer data says it could be much older, probably over 500,000 years. At first, scientists were sure that the lake was in an ancient crater of a long extinct volcano. But then, Geologists made a detailed analysis of the soil and water and found out that Lunar Lake has a space origin. The minerals found in its soil are similar to those found in moon rocks brought to Earth during the Apollo program. The lake is an impact crater left by a huge meteorite, which was almost six times heavier than the Empire State Building. The impact was so strong that the volcanic rock melted and turned into glass. In 2020, the lake, which was already unusual enough, suddenly turned pink. It wasn't a part of an early Barbie movie marketing campaign. The detailed analysis showed that the water contained an increased level of unique microbes. They accumulate on the surface and emit some pink pigment. After a while, the microbes settled to the bottom and the lake became transparent again. Flamingos that got their food from the lake also got to taste some of the microbes and became an even brighter shade of pink than usual. One of the most famous sites of Yellowstone National Park is the Grand Prismatic Spring. It's one of the largest springs in the world, and it's inspired people who have seen it since at least the 19th century. Back then, a group of trappers mentioned an indigo blue lake boiling like a huge cauldron. Decades later, expeditions came to the spring to study it better and explain its unusual appearance. But because the spring at its widest point is longer than an American football field, they had to build a special vessel and travel far from the shore. The scientists traveling in the boat never wore life vests. They knew those would be useless if the boat tipped over. The water in the middle of the spring is of near boiling temperature and those vibrant colors are the result of extreme organisms living in the hot water. The temperature changes as you travel away from the center. Different species that don't mind the heat have settled in different parts of the pool, giving it its famous diverse pigments. Back in the early 20th century, someone got the interesting idea to try to irrigate a part of Nevada's Black Rock Desert. They drilled a well and found lots of water, but it was near boiling temperature. The water was clearly not good for agriculture, so the human-made geyser was left abandoned. Over the decades, it slowly turned into an impressive cone of calcium carbonate deposits. Then, in 1964, a geothermic energy company drilled another well close to the first one. The water they had found was of the same temperature. This time, it wasn't hot enough for their needs to produce energy, so they decided to cap the well and leave. But Water managed to get up and out, and it completely dried up the first geyser. The second one, which got the name Fly Geyser, is still flowing burning hot water rich in minerals. The cone is multicolored and looks like it's not from this planet, thanks to the algae living in it, which love the heat. Every summer, Caño Cristales in Colombia turns into a liquid rainbow, or the River of Five Colors. At this time, and until the end of fall, the conditions are just right for the riverbed to turn bright red, yellow, green, blue, and black. 
We owe this beauty to certain aquatic plants growing in the river, a special type of river weed. During the wet season, the river moves fast and the sun cannot get to these plants. During the dry season, there isn't enough water to feed them, so the time in between the seasons has the perfect conditions for this colorful show. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. At some point, the number of tourists who wanted to see it became so huge that scientists got concerned it could be bad for this hotspot of biodiversity. The area is home to rare species of animals, birds, and plants. Now, there are ecotourism trails and strict opening hours. In August 2014, a man in Tunisia was going back home from the north after doing his business. It was a hot summer evening and he was dreaming about water when suddenly it popped up right in front of him. There was a whole lake in the middle of the desert and the man was pretty sure it hadn't been there several days before. The new body of water got the nickname Mysterious Lake and actually became a great mystery. Hundreds of people came here to swim in the clear, cool water. The lake became a popular place, but a few days later, the water turned dark green. The locals didn't care about this and continued to bathe in the lake. But when scientists and geologists arrived at the place, they announced that the water was dangerous to swim in. The lake was stagnating. It didn't refresh itself from underground streams, and the rains didn't feed it either. That's why the water became moldy and dirty. The lake contained algae and a lot of harmful bacteria dangerous to the human body. Scientists also found out that the land in this region had phosphate deposits. This substance can decay. But even that didn't stop people from bathing in the lake in the middle of the desert. How it got there remains a mystery. Some experts think that heavy rains have filled a hole in the ground with water. Another, more popular theory says that an earthquake had formed the lake. The seismic activity must have torn the Earth's crust above the water table, and then underground springs had filled the crevice. So, in theory, the lake could drain back out one day, just as suddenly as it had appeared. So, does the mysterious Devil's Gardens in the Amazon rainforest ring any bells? Eh, don't worry. It's not some spooky phenomenon. It's the work of some tiny but mighty insects called the lemon ants. These ants inject a natural herbicide, formic acid, into any other plant that is not the tree species that they call home. By doing this, they create a space for their treehouse saplings to grow, allowing the ant colony to expand as it occupies new nesting sites in the saplings. That's some efficient gardening, if you ask me. But don't be fooled. These devil gardens are not just a bunch of boring old trees. In fact, they are botanical anomalies that grow very slowly every year, and some of them are over 800 years old. Hello. Who knew ants could create such impressive and long-lasting structures? Of course, the rainforest is still one of the most diverse ecosystems on Earth, with a remarkable diversity of plant life. But it's fascinating to see the control ants can have over their environment, creating single-species structures in such a complex ecosystem. But where does the name Devil's Garden come from? We know ants are to blame, but is there something else hiding in the Amazon rainforest? Well, picture this. You're strolling along, taking in the lush foliage, when suddenly you stumble upon a clearing. But wait, there's something strange about this patch of land. There's no vegetation, just a handful of trees standing alone in the dirt. What's going on here? It's easy to understand why people came up with this name after seeing the weird stretch of vegetation. And as humans do, they came up with quite an impressive legend to back up the story. It was said that the inhabitant of this eerie oasis was a shape-shifting evil spirit. Like me. <laughs> Just kidding. This little guy may have looked like a misshapen person walking on one hoof and one human foot. But don't be fooled. He supposedly had a whole bag of tricks up his sleeve including the ability to transform into someone you know and lead you down the path to doom. Hey, it's just a myth, but you have to admit it was quite convincing, right? Clever landscaping ants aside, there are a lot of unsolved mysteries hidden in the Amazon rainforest. Like its unusual geoglyphs, for example. Humans have been getting creative with the Earth's surface for ages. Geoglyphs are just one of the many ways we've left our mark on this planet. 
Basically, we take some sand or stones, move them around a bit, and voila! We've got ourselves a funky design that pops against the backdrop of the ground. A new study found that the area was home to up to 1 million people before Columbus first arrived in the New World back in 1492. That's a lot of people, and they left behind some pretty cool stuff. The Amazon rainforest is already amazing, with 1 in 10 known species in the world living there, and 1 in 5 of Earth's birds. But did you know that over the past few decades, archaeologists have discovered evidence of numerous large complex societies that may have inhabited Amazonia? It turns out that the Amazon rainforest was not just a pristine wilderness, but a hub of human activity as well. These South American geoglyphs are particularly interesting. They're these huge structures that combine square, circular, and hexagonal shapes. Archaeologists have found very few remains of habitation inside the enclosures, which suggests they were not settlements. Instead, the most likely explanation is that they were used for ceremonial gatherings. The exact function of these structures is still a mystery, though. To find out how widespread human settlements were in the Amazon, scientists focus on the basin of the upper reaches of the Tapius River, a major tributary of the Amazon. Using satellite images, they discovered 81 new archaeological sites in the upper Tapios Basin, with a total of 104 earthworks. That means there is no gap in the network of earthworks spanning across Amazonia's southern rim. When researchers conducted ground surveys of 24 of these sites, they found evidence that the sites they visited were once inhabited. These sites dated from 1250 to 1500 CE and range from about 100 to 1300 feet wide. The largest were typically hexagonal fortified settlements, suggesting a certain degree of planning and uniformity in their construction. Based on the size and distributions of the earthworks, the researchers suggested that similar settlements may have extended over about 154,000 square miles of the southern rim of the Amazon, supporting a population of between 500,000 and 1 million people in late pre-Columbian times. Of course, the new study doesn't mean the Amazon rainforest was ever a teeming megalopolis. It's still mostly uncharted. So, we have no idea how pre-Columbian populations were distributed across Amazonia. But it's exciting to learn about these ancient societies and the cool things they left behind. The scientists plan to do more excavations in the Upper Tapios Basin to refine their understanding of the cultural developments there. Who knows what they'll find next? Maybe a lost city full of treasure and adventure. Also hidden in the vast habitat of the Amazon is this next quirky creature. Ever heard of the Amazon Pink River Dolphins? Unfortunately, there is still so much we don't know about them. First things first, though, let's talk about what they look like. So picture this, a small, light-colored dolphin with a pink nose and lips. Ah, they're the Barbie of dolphins! Aside from that, they look like regular dolphins with plump bodies, bulbous foreheads, skinny snouts, chubby cheeks, and small eyes. They can be found in countries like Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, and Peru. They're also the only species of river dolphin found in the Amazon River. Unfortunately, these little guys are officially critically endangered species, so there are not many specimens available that scientists can study. No other name is more famous when it comes to exploring the Amazon rainforest than that of Percy Fawcett. He dedicated his life to exploring the area in search of a lost city. And not just any city, but an ancient, mysterious city that he called Z. Sounds like something straight out of an Indiana Jones movie, right? Percy was born in England in 1867 and had quite a career before he started exploring. But he didn't let his profession hold him back from following his dreams of exploring South America. In fact, he made seven expeditions to the Amazon between 1906 and 1924, each time getting closer to uncovering the secrets of Z. Now, let me tell you a little bit about how large the Amazon rainforest is. How big is it? I asked myself. It's so big that you could fit the whole of the UK and Ireland into it a whopping 17 times. That's a lot of trees and animals to navigate through. But Percy was up for the challenge. Despite his best efforts, Percy never found the lost city of Z, 
And sadly, he disappeared during his final expedition in 1925. But his legacy lived on through the years, inspiring many to become archaeologists and explorers themselves. In fact, a book called The Lost City of Z was written about Percy's adventures and was even made into a movie. It's not all hidden mysteries and wild nature out there. There are around a million indigenous folks living their best lives in the Amazon rainforest. That's right, they hunt, fish, farm, and even have access to Western medicine and education. But here's the kicker. Not all of these folks are keen on socializing with outsiders. And can you blame them? For years, loggers, miners, and ranchers have been, shall we say, behaving badly toward these communities. It's no wonder that some tribes have chosen to stay isolated and protect themselves from the dangers of the outside world. In fact, in 2018, Brazilian authorities were able to snap a photo of a man dubbed the indigenous man in the hole. He's the last remaining member of his tribe. But don't feel too bad for him. He's doing just fine on his own and has made it pretty clear that he's not interested in outside visitors. The authorities still leave him some seeds and tools, though, so it's not all bad news. Imagine a world of seething hot metal where iron and nickel dance in a fiery inferno. This is the inner core, the heart of our planet. But what if this very heart was changing? The latest research suggests that the Earth's inner core may be slowing down and even reversing its rotation. Is this a sign of the end of times? Will the Earth come crashing down on itself? Let's find out. Imagine you have a giant onion, and every layer represents a different layer of the Earth. The center of this onion, the part you can never reach, represents Earth's core. It's like a mysterious land that no one has ever set foot on, yet scientists have been trying to uncover its secrets for centuries. Imagine diving deep into the center of the Earth, beyond the crust, the mantle, and finally 1,800 miles below the surface where you'd reach the inner core. It's a ball of seething hot metal made up of solid iron and nickel, and it's so hot it glows a brilliant white. It's also surrounded by a liquid outer core. This mysterious place is unlike anything else on our planet. And get this, it's spinning on its own axis. The inner core is like a fire tornado that's constantly swirling, generating heat and energy from the inside out. But why is it so important to study this little piece of the Earth? Well, it's responsible for creating our magnetic field. This magnetic field is important to study because it protects us from harmful radiation from the sun. It's created by the movement of molten metal in the Earth's outer core and the spinning of the Earth. These movements generate electrical currents, which then create the magnetic field. It's like a shield that protects us and helps us keep our planet healthy and safe. But there's still so much we don't know about the inner core. For example, how did it form? Scientists believe it started to solidify about 1 billion years ago. But why did this happen? What was the trigger? Or, for example, what about the inner core's crystal structure? It's thought to be a type of iron called hexagonal closed-packed iron, but we still don't know if it's actually the case. In other words, we may have many theories, but unfortunately, there's no way to confirm them, at least for now. So how do scientists study the inner core if no one can go there? They use seismology. Seismology is like a sonic scanner for the Earth. You send sound waves through the Earth and measure how they bounce back to see what's inside. That's basically how we discovered the inner core way back in the 1930s. Imagine you're listening to the sound waves with your special seismology machine. Suddenly, you hear a strange sound like a ping. It's different from the other sounds you've been hearing, and you can't explain why. You keep listening, and you hear the ping again and again. You start to realize that this ping is happening every time the sound wave hits the Earth's center. You study the data more and more, and finally, you figure it out. The Earth has a solid core. This discovery was a big breakthrough and helped us better understand what's inside our planet and how it works. 
Right now, scientists also use something like this to study what's inside our planet. When earthquakes occur, waves travel through the Earth and bounce off different layers, including the inner core. By studying these waves, scientists can learn about the inner core's properties, such as its density and temperature. They're basically solving a mystery by piecing together tiny clues. And every new discovery brings us one step closer to understanding it. The inner core is a unique and fascinating part of our planet. It's a place where the laws of physics work in different ways than they do on the surface. And it's a place where scientists are still trying to unravel its many mysteries. And here's one of them. For some reason, the heart of our planet is about to stop spinning. A new study about this was published in Nature Geoscience. It was made by the researchers at Peking University in China. It has revealed a huge twist. The scientists found that the inner core spin rate has slowed down significantly. It's something that no one expected. But according to the results of their study, the slowing down began all the way back in 2009. And that's not all. Their results also suggest that the inner core may be reversing its rotation. That's right. This hot ball of iron and nickel that has been spinning around for millions of years may be slowing down and changing direction. It's like when a spinning top starts to slow down, except this is happening in the center of our planet. Scientists have been puzzled over the discovery for quite some time now. So, what does it all mean? And why is this happening? Well, it turns out that there might be a larger pattern at play. The scientists believe that this change in the inner core's rotation may be due to the influence of Earth's mantle and the magnetic field of Earth's outer core. The mantle and the outer core are affecting the inner core, which is causing its spinning rate to slow down and potentially change direction. Before this study, scientists thought that the inner core was spinning faster than the Earth's crust. However, this new information suggests that the inner core may be slowing down due to the gravitational effect of the Earth's mantle and the magnetic field of its outer core. But here's where it gets even more interesting. When researchers took a closer look at data stretching all the way back to the 1960s, they discovered that the rotation of Earth's inner core was consistent from the late 1970s to the early 2000s. Before that, they found that another possible slowing down or reversal event may have occurred in the early 1970s. It's like the inner core spin is like a roller coaster ride, speeding up, slowing down, and possibly reversing course over a period of time. The researchers estimate that these switches occur every seven decades or so, which is pretty wild. But why is it happening? Unfortunately, we still have no idea. The exact reasons for why the Earth's inner core sometimes stops and starts spinning in another direction aren't yet well understood. However, scientists believe that it may be due to complex interactions between the solid inner core and the surrounding molten outer core. A lot of different things can be at play here. The changes in the temperature, pressure, and composition of the core, as well as the movement of material within the core itself, and so on. Also, as we said before, the Earth's magnetic field and the gravitational forces from the surrounding mantle might also play a role here. We need further research to fully understand the mechanisms behind the inner core's rotation changes. So, is the world ending? Fortunately, no, not just yet. While the inner core is changing direction right now, it's not the end of the world as we know it. And even though findings may seem like a huge deal, life on Earth's surface hasn't been impacted much, if at all. In fact, it's just a fascinating part of the Earth's inner workings that we're learning more about every day. So, you can say with relief, nothing cataclysmic is happening. Moreover, according to Hervoya Kalsic, a geophysicist at Australian National University, the inner core is now more in sync with the rest of the planet than a decade ago when it was spinning a bit faster. All in all, this new study has added a strange twist to the story of Earth's inner core, and scientists believe that there's still much more to discover about this mysterious place. Who knows what other secrets lie in the heart of our planet? The possibilities are endless. So let's keep researching and enjoy our time on this amazing planet.